All right, welcome back in. We are pre-seasoning as we continue our conversations with all 14 ACC baseball head coaches here on ACC Baseball, etc. I'm Darren Vaught, pumped to have our next coach in the long line to talk about the a uh, little bit about the fall because we didn't visit with him then, but also the 2024 edition of his Clemson Tigers. It is going into his second year as the head coach, Eric Backich of Clemson. And uh, Eric, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, we've I've had a little bit of scheduling issues myself, so I'm glad, um, A, for your patience and your friendship and your your willingness to, to support us here and um, not leave me high and dry as I am a little bit late getting to our call today. Uh, but I hope you're well. Yeah, you would have definitely been scratched from the lineup if you were a starter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you'd be on the bench uh, it's all good hey i'm glad to glad to be on appreciate you having me on and uh, appreciate what you do to promote college baseball in the acc yeah we're we're uh excited to do it and excited for for this year in particular acc baseball etc is presented by pitch logic by the way the system used by players coaches scouts and instructors at all levels of play from youth leagues to the big leagues, the easy to use and affordable technology makes the platform accessible to every player at every level. All the metrics and features used at the highest level. You can go to pitchlogic.com for more information. Um, well, let's begin with how, how different today is for you and your role there at Clemson from you know this time exactly one year ago. Uh, the, the season that you guys had last year, does that change the way you think you, you would prepare for the beginning of this season at all? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously pointing to the ACC championship, number four overall national seed. Uh, I, I don't know that that's – you certainly play for that, but I, I don't know that it's something that you expect going into to year one in that role, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, for us, the – Similarity is the target's going to always stay on growth. So last year's team 126 um, didn't get to where we wanted to go, but had some nice storylines behind it and, you know, have a championship to, to show for it forever. Uh, this year, team 127, the same spot, continual growth and improvement. Uh, the, you know, the, the risks and the, and the threats or, you know, maybe managing expectations. Um, you got guys that, probably had the target on compete and, you know, as hard as they can and earn a position or keep a position. And then they have tremendous success. Um, they can't go into this season thinking that they need to replicate add on, um, and just keep the target on competing. So yeah, we, we had some things to build off of from last year as a team, uh, a championship, a host, uh, but ultimately we finished the season, not in Omaha. Um, so it's that, it's that compound effect of just keep improving. So we, we hope to get hot at the end and, you know, be the last team standing, but, um, individually with the guys, just making sure that they keep the target where it needs to be on, on today and not thinking about, you know, what the accolades will be six months from now. Yeah. What, what was your general impression of the fall? I mean, I would imagine pretty good energy, um, knowing the, 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 guys that you have coming back from a season ago that's just going to be carried over for the most part but since we haven't gotten to talk about the fall um what did you learn about your your team your current group for this year uh just i don't know if i learned anything other than they're very hungry and um they came into the fall on a mission on a purpose of of you know with an edge i'd say like a chip um disappointed still the sting of um feeling like we were, you know, moving a hundred miles an hour and then just crashed. Um, so I think still very much with that, that open wound that will never close that is, is fueling them this season, uh, in a, a lot of guys, a lot of different ways, but, um, just, just hungry and, uh, wanting, wanting to attack the fall, um, and have a group of, of returning players and, and kind of get that, that interconnectivity with the new guys as well, which I thought we did a really good job of this fall. I thought we uh, we did enough off the field team building type events that it made the 
you know, the cohesion and the harmony on the field accelerate a bit. So uh, everything was good. We have a nice blend of returning and, and new players. I don't know roles right now, but, you know, there are some guys that were in leadership roles last year, like a Blake Wright, that will be returning in a leadership role this year. Uh, but the exact positions, we've got some depth and we've got some maneuverability uh, with with guys being able to play different positions. So um, we have no excuses. At least that's the thought coming out of the fall. No reason why we couldn't be a great team. Um, so just it's just committing to get better every day so that we, you know, earn that opportunity to get hot at the end because it's it's. That's a tough thing. It's uh, and that's what every coach chases, every team chases, is get hot at the right time. But you got to put in the time, uh, all the months and days leading up to it. So this group has done a fantastic job. You know, we say how you do anything is how you do everything, and this group just shattered a a team GPA record. They got a 3.27, which broke the record we set last year for a 3.09. And for all the people that you know, what's academics got to do with? athletics well it's just more of a mindset of wanting to be great in everything you do because how you do anything is how you do everything and so uh no discipline issues no off the field issues with this group they're very focused um laser focused and so seeing the hunger that they have inside them to build upon what last year's team did uh is encouraging and motivating as a coaching staff yeah. Uh, a couple of things in there I, I do want to dissect. And I'm not expecting you to like break news in terms of roles and that sort of thing. Um, I am curious, though, about how you wrap your mind around depth and and having options in that way. Um, I, I know that's going to be the case for, for multiple teams in the ACC this year. Uh, just sort of coaching philosophically wise, um, how would you prefer that pan out? Do you like the flexibility? Would you prefer to to kind of have a you know a one through nine that's that's mostly set for the majority of the season by a certain certain point in the year? How are you looking at it? Well, it's a meritocracy. I think every coach would tell you that the best nine guys are going to play, the best pitcher is going to pitch, and having the ability to get guys to buy into this concept of love the team more than you love your role is probably the toughest thing because everybody, especially today's generation, associates happiness and playing time together. Um, and so when you do have depth, it's it's a good problem to have, but it, it does present some issues in the form of threats of the thing that is the number one team killer, which is selfish behaviors. and. Um, so that'll be the number one threat for any team, but especially a team with depth. And I would put us in that category of a team with depth, uh, but getting guys to truly love the team and, and you know, be happy when the guy who um, also plays your same position does well and, uh, and be ready and stay ready uh, to jump in there when the opportunity presents itself, because there's going to be bumps and bruises and nicks and scrapes and guys need a break here or there and roles change all the time. And very, I've never seen a team where the opening day lineup is the, the, the exact same lineup as the end of the season lineup. So just knowing that going into it, uh, is motivation enough for a lot of guys. Um, but the roles are going to change, but we, we need everybody pulling the rope in the same direction and know that uh, we'll be fair, but we can't be equal in turn when it comes to playing time. This, you know, we're at that level now where, you know, it's just, it's just, you know, it's not guaranteed that everyone gets in every game. And, and that's tough because you want to see everyone get in every game, but that's just not the way it goes. So. Uh, the evolution of the lineup and the pitching staff and the roles will happen over time. It's not going to be set early on, and that's a good thing. And you get to play different people and and move some things around and just try to find that best, you know, the best nine guys that make up the best, most competitive team. Yeah. Uh, you talked about returners, newcomers. I'm curious about that mix. What um... – what would you say is is the how much overlap is there in the Venn diagram in terms of of guys who are going to look to make at, at least in terms of your expectations, the team's expectations, their own individual expectations, um, the overlap of guys who are who are set to to make a large impact for your team? How much of that is 
going to be divvied up between both returners and and uh, those guys new to the program. Yeah, I mean, there's a nucleus of guys that have, you know, that have earned the opportunity to fail, right? Like Cam Canarella is not going to platoon early on, right? Yeah. We, we know we know he's and he's continued to keep the target on growth and improvement, and he's added strength and added size, and you know, he's it's a guy who could get out of bed, you know, at six a.m. and probably you know hit a double, um, <laughs> but you know, he's 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 uh, he just has a slow heartbeat and. You know, Blake Wright, uh, Will Taylor, you know, there's guys that have proven themselves in this program. Um, and so those are the guys that, you know, are going to are going to be out there and be counted on and, you know, be in those those spots in the order with that you want them coming up the most. And I think everyone else will earn, you know, maybe the platoon guys from last year, the Jack Crichton's and the Nate Hall's and the Jacob Gerald's, you know, they're all factoring in. And then we have a, a you know, a bunch of new guys that have come in that have just, you know, inserted themselves as the, you know, it's a chance to make, make an impact, but those are the guys that will, I think will, you know, be, you know, get uh, that they'll be able to spread some of those reps around until we figure out, you know, who are the best uh, pieces to to add to, you know, some of those guys that, you know, really we feel uh, have that star star potential, like a Cam Canarella, Willie Taylor, Blake Wright, uh, and so on. Yeah, I, I want to circle back on Cam. He had such a such a remarkable first year of his collegiate career for you, and it was it was not unexpected. I, I think. He's a good player, um, but he he sort of provided in a role that I don't know that this time last year you guys were 100 percent certain was going to be his in in center field in the leadoff spot for the the continue to, for the entirety of the year. And I, I saw him with um, Team USA trials over the summer and um, knowing he's a guy who, who played shortstop as as a high school star and and sort of it was it was new to him making that adjustment out to the outfield and he turned out to be really really great at it um what from the beginning of year one to now the beginning of year two has has been the biggest point of growth for him and I know you mentioned physicals and, and strength and that sort of thing um, maybe there's something else baseball wise between the lines Cam is Cam is very steady, and I think that's why he's so good. He's very consistent. He's got the, one of the highest levels of compete of any athlete I've been around. I mean, he genuinely gets ticked off when he does not do well, um, and it's a fire that burns inside him that's just different. I mean, he just is very competitive, which you don't know that until you see him actually in the competition arena because he's very quiet and unassuming, uh, which – going into the season last year or even into the fall. Uh, you know, it's a, a slightly built at the time kid that played infield, didn't say much, had this really unique ability to put the barrel on the ball, like just the consistent hard contact jumped, you know, was was something that was just like kind of a eye opener wow thing from the fall last year. So we knew we had to get him in the lineup somewhere just because of the consistency of the of firing his barrel accurately. Um, and so that was the, that and timing is everything. And, and Will Taylor was kind of the projected center fielder, even though he was at football, but came in and, you know, had a, uh, was still taking care of the knee that he had banged up. Um, and so Will Taylor wasn't able to jump right into the outfield at the beginning of last year. And Cam is such a natural athlete. We just threw him out there. And uh, I, you know, he's one of three guys I've said this before that have an ability to when the ball is hit off the bat to put his head down, run to a spot, turn around and catch the ball. It's only been two other guys, at least that I've coached in 22 years that have been able to do that. But he's one of them. Um, he's one of those three. And uh, he's a game changer defensively as well as a game changer offensively. So I think the key for him is keeping that target on his strength keeping his strength his strength which is his level of compete and his level of compete makes him very consistent because while one fire burns really really high here in the compete zone the ability to have a slow heartbeat and keep his mind still so to speak um while he's competing I, it's just it's just this 
this odd, unique combination that he's really good at. And um, just while he's hyper competitive, he's also moving slow in a good way mentally. Yeah, I think I told you this last year when he was still just a, a comparatively sort of an unsuspecting ACC player um, early in the season is when I had you guys. It was the Duke series at um, at, at there at Doug Kingsmore. And um, we had you on afterward. And I told you that he he had sort of climbed the, the ranks of my favorite players to watch in the ACC. So just with that being said, I, I'm. Really excited to to see him in year number two, and um, you know he's steady. So, like you said, we kind of know what we're getting, um, but the sky's the limit for that guy for sure. You, you mentioned you mentioned Will Taylor. He is exclusively a baseball player now, and it's it's Joe Healy, I believe, wrote our fall report for you guys uh, over at D1Baseball.com, and um, he mentioned that that could be sort of a game changer for Will, who's already a, a really, really good baseball player. Um, what's the difference been for him in in being able to narrow it in? Just because, I mean, look, you know, you know that to be a college athlete for one sport is highly demanding enough. And kudos to the people, Will included, who could divvy up their time and do both. And you talked about the team GPA. He's a part of that, a good student, too. Um, what's the difference been like for him now that he's, he's sort of, um, it's not that he's, he was less focused before, but he is, he is 100% yours as an athlete. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the two, two things that stand out, you know, this is the first time in Will Taylor's life that he's specialized in baseball. And you think about how many kids make that critical mistake and how many parents make that mistake of having their kids specialize in one sport too young because sport sampling is what creates athleticism and building the athlete first, especially at a young age will make you a better baseball player. And that's what we have seen with Will Taylor because he was a football player and a wrestler and everything and a baseball player. He's become a really, really good athlete, an explosive, unique athlete. The other part of this is that what he's got above the neck above that athletic ability um, is a, is a, in, in the family that he's been raised in. Um, when I met with his will and his dad up in the Cape uh, and, and they were willing to give up their football scholarship to not be on any money, no scholarship. He's on no money right now. He's on a full ride in football and now he's on no money in baseball just so he could focus on baseball and coming off some previous conversations where people were wanting a lot of NIL money. And then Will Taylor's dad says, we don't want any handouts. Clemson has enriched our lives and went down that path. I I just want to come across the table and and hug him uh, because you just don't, you know, you don't hear people, dads, kids talk like that very often. So he, he's a very special player, not just from his physical ability, but how he's been raised and the mental makeup that he has. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited for him. Uh, you're not going to find a better person out there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, I mean, look, we you don't have to tell us at D1 Baseball the, the, the um, issues or the nuances of – Scholarships. Ask me about, ask in, me about NIL. Yeah. Me about <laughs> well, I mean, if you really want to, well, if you really want me to, I, I was going to ask um, specifically about Will there and and getting him a scholarship. Again, you don't have to tell us at D one Baseball the nuances of of that and what goes into that and the complications. But is that something that's that's on the radar? Do you, do you now have to to consider that and you know finding finding a slot for him to to get him that? Thanks for asking about NIL. I appreciate you asking. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a big problem because what everyone knows is we have 11.7 scholarships, which were the, you know, we're the most underfunded major sport in college athletics. What everyone maybe doesn't connect the dots on is, 
you know, college baseball players and equivalency sport athletes, the like softball, soccer's everyone that don't get full scholarships are not using NIL as this pay for play thing. We're using NIL to cover our bills to, so instead of pay for play, it's pay our bills. NIL is used for equivalency sport athletes like baseball to pay our tuition, to pay our cost of attendance fees, right? Now, the problem with that is those are taxable dollars. So not only are we getting, trying to get NIL deals, these players are out here trying to get NIL deals to pay for the cost of attendance, they're getting taxed on it, all right? And what scholarship is tax-free money. You get a scholarship, you don't pay taxes on it. It's not income, right? The other problem on the other side is who's giving those dollars? Donors. Well, now donors are having to give after-tax dollars to NIL because NIL is not a charitable gift. So you got the group that's paying for it, which are your donors, that are having to give out. So if they, so if a guy's in a 30 some percent tax bracket, 30 percent tax bracket, he's got to make a dollar 30 to give a dollar. Right. So it's a broken deal. Uh, but as baseball coaches, as baseball players, you know, we're in a, until scholarships go up to where we're a headcount sport, like the bigger sports out there that, you know, are the money makers. Um, our kids are at a disadvantage uh, because they're they're out trying to secure NIL deals, but they're, they're, you know, they're going to get taxed on them, but those dollars are going right towards paying their bills. Um, and so if I was a, a student athlete of an equivalency sport, a SAC member of that, that would be the thing I'd be uh, pounding my fist about. And so for us, you know, what that that's the gap of, we have, we have a 40 man roster and 11.7 guys on scholarship and 28.3 guys are not and paying their own way. And the cost of that, is what we'd like to cover in NIL. And that's, uh, that's you know, that's a big number. It's north of seven figures. So it's big, it's not insurmountable, but for college baseball, uh, we need that. And uh, that, would be, that would be a game changer so that, you know, when kids uh, are deciding to choose a school, it's not necessarily a decision of a few thousand more dollars here or there uh, for what they owe in bills. Their, their cost of attendance costs their their tuition bills and so forth are covered yeah amen like i said you're preaching to the choir here but i'm glad i'm glad that um you are are willing to sort of advocate in that way um out loud if you will like like we are and and i know in a lot of t a lot of cases coaches and, and players it, it can put you guys in tougher situations to be as outspoken about it so um no, i don't know why you. I don't know why it's tough to be outspoken about it. It's it's a common sense right wrong thing. So why not be outspoken about it? Why why NIL for half the athletes is income and for the other the equivalency sport athletes they're using NIL to pay their tuition and they're getting taxed on it. Yeah. What what sense does that make? <laughs> I I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, last year I mentioned that Duke series when, when you and I actually, it was when we had met prior to, to me calling those games. Um, it, it, it's interesting because it was, it was relatively early in the season, Eric, and you guys got off to that shakier start. And, um, you had told me there at, at Kingsmore stadium, you were like, yeah, I think we're, I think we're pretty good. I think we're a tournament team, which, you know, um, not that I was like not believing what you said. I trust your eyes being with the team and and knowing more baseball than me. Stop it, Darren. But, you didn't believe me one bit. No, but at that time, right? It was it was it was a point in the season at sure. which you know most people probably would have doubted that. Um, but credit to you, credit to your guys, credit to your coaching staff. It it, it was a totally different team by the time it mattered, right? Um, I bring that up to say when when we had talked, the depth of the pitching staff was probably the one main concern or or the um, you know the one the one thing that if you guys were going to have success, that was what was going to turn a, a major corner for you. You got a lot of pitchers back. Um, how comfortable are you with with pitching entering this season? Yeah, well, really comfortable. Um, we love 
the returners we have back. Obviously, the losses of Caden Grice and and uh, Ryan Ammons, Jackson Lindley, those are those are big. But to see the amount of innings coming back this year, of guys who've been in high leverage roles, guys who have pitched in, you know, just close games, nail biter type games, um, made starts, came in relief, you know, have have had different roles. That'll be the fun part of figuring out, you know, what the rotation is going to be coupled with, you know, who's who's the who's the back end guy, who's the high leverage guy. So we we do love the depth of that. In addition to the the new guys that have come in that have uh, looked to be extremely talented uh, to answer your first question, it's always the adversity that makes you better. If you label that stress and adversity is good. And we do. We look at every opportunity where we get knocked down as the opportunity to get back up. Every bad call, everything negative that happens, it's good. It's uh, it's it's an opportunity to grow. Uh, and so we label stress and, and negative events in that way of being able to turn it into a positive. So all those times early on, starting two and eight in the ACC, being just above 500 halfway through the season, um, didn't deter us. It wasn't anything where the guys were going to throw in the towel because we knew we were close. We knew we were capable uh, and just we had to use all of that, all of those times getting knocked down to just just callous the mind. And and once we caught a few breaks, got a few guys healthy, Ryan Ammons came back, Jackson Lindley, got, you know, all the guys moved Caden Grice to the rotation. You know, we had to we had to be willing to do some things a little bit different, try some things that, you know, fortunately, uh, worked, but all the teams that you see that are the championship teams, um, very rarely do, does it feel like they were went wire to wire and just had no struggles and had no adversities. I think it's quite contrary. They'll talk about all the adversity that made them the team that they are, and they found their identity as they went, uh, or that adversity strengthened them and presented an opportunity for other guys to step up, whether it's a football national championship like we just saw, um, or in baseball where, you know, it's a many more games and, um, you have a, you have chances to, to just continually improve and grow. Yeah. I love that. The two bullet points from this conversation, just in the way that you guys coach that team is the, the focus on growth and what you were just talking about, the ability or the, the willingness to, to take negative circumstances or, or those things that could be deemed as negative circumstances. And we talked a, a lot about this last year and viewing it instead as an opportunity and, and understanding that it's a privilege to have an opportunity to grow. I, I just, I love that about the way that you guys have, um, have begun and, and continued to, to coach your team. Um, let me finish up with this one. And this this could be a two parter. It could be specifically about the pitching staff. Maybe if there's anybody else that comes to mind. Um, not that not that I am trying to get you to put heavy pressure on individual players in you know talking with um, with me here on on the show. But I, I think maybe the way to put it would be: um, Is there a player who? Because I would imagine if there if there is an expectation for a player, you've had that conversation or it's implied in some way, right? So I, I, I'm not expecting you to just come out of nowhere and say, this guy needs to be big for us this year. Um, is there somebody who's who's who was on the team last year who just sort of stands to have a bigger role this year that that comes to mind that that maybe, you know, we can circle for fans? Yeah, I think you could you could look if we're just talking about pitchers, just look at who are the guys last year that got significant innings or were in significant roles that are back in the easy point to Austin Gordon, uh, Team USA invite, uh, easy point to Tristan Smith. You know, he he kind of stitched through starter, high leverage reliever. He even closed games early. Um, he's a ton better, um, and then. You know, Ethan Darden was a was a Friday night guy for us last year that also pitched out of the pen. And, you know, his role, the evolution of him last year from from margin guy to to long relief to short relief to margin to starter, you know, and, and then Friday starter. Um, and then some guys that uh, also had experience starting like Joe Allen and Billy Barlow, um, who battled a few little bumps and bruises along the way who are now healthy. And then some guys on the back end that 
you know, really were uh, like Nick Clayton. I mean, he he pitched. It feels like I, every time I remember us playing, he pitched in the game. Sometime um, <laughs> he had a ton of appearances. Uh, and then Rob Hughes came onto the scene late last year once he finally got healthy, and he he was a huge spark for the for the back end of the pitching staff. You know, adding the the two Wofford transfers, Matthew Marshall and Lucas Malstad, proven guys at the Division One level, uh, certainly a, a a big boost. And then you have all these freshmen that have come in, and they're just like, you know, wow, these guys are uber talented. Um, you know, you could literally list all of them in a row. Um, because all of them are going to pitch and all of them have a chance to, you know, certainly make some kind of an impact in there. Uh, but uh, you'll see those names. Those will be household names for Clemson baseball when it's all said and done. So, yeah, we again, the threat is get, keeping these guys happy. There's not enough innings to go around for the talent um, of this pitching staff, but just of the strength of the older guys returning that bring – experience because experience wins in college baseball it's just just does um coupled with the insertion of some new guys you know i just feel good about the pitching and feel good about the simplistic genius of a guy like jimmy bellinger who you know you you see some programs and they, they throw in their bullpens and it looks like they're trying to launch a rocket and then you've got jimmy bellinger back there just you know focusing on strikes yeah, and 64 percent strikes if you can throw 64% strikes in the bullpen, then you're going to be able to translate it into the scrimmages and into the games. And so I, I love it. I love just the the focus on command because at the younger levels, when everyone's trying to develop stuff, because stuff is how you get recruited, you got to be able to show you can throw hard or make the ball move or do this or do that. And the, the focus on command isn't always there. You go to a showcase, the count gets to 3 2, he walks the guy, the guy doesn't have to take his base, he stays in there and faces all fastballs. Like the kids aren't learning the emphasis of command. Command is really important. Like, you know, if you don't throw strikes, you don't pitch. Um, so, you know, all the, the, the talent with the stuff, with the emphasis from a coaching standpoint on strikes, compete, body language, uh, it's a good recipe. It's a good recipe for success, and we saw that to your earlier question, the evolution of the pitching staff and the buy-in of that, and um, got better because we got you know got guys standing behind those pitchers. It's nine against one, you know. When in doubt, you just, you know, don't walk the guy, make him hit it. You got guys behind it that want to make plays, so it, um, it it you know optimistic. You know, this time of year, every coach should be cautiously optimistic because you know. Still inner squad time, which means everybody's still playing, uh, which means everybody's still happy. Uh, and then once you got to go from two teams in inner squad to one team against another shirt, it's a little different. Um, so figuring out those pieces will be a challenge, but a good challenge. Yeah, that's well said. I've got two two quick ones that just popped in my brain. Just a housekeeping question, Coach. Um, is Jack Leggett has retained his role on staff from the same one he had a year ago. Is that right? Jack Leggett is Clemson baseball. <laughs> Clemson baseball is Jack Leggett. He's, you know, he's got a, a quarter of a century in, in this program. How can he not uh, retain his role and be here all the time? Good. I was looking, I was going to be thrilled with a simple yes, which I thought was already true, but just getting the confirmation there. But um, to hear you say it that way, that's, that's awesome. And then um, this is a non-baseball question. Look, you spent significant time and did significant things at Michigan. Um, I assume you watched the the college football national championship and, and their win earlier this week. I did one better than that, Darren. I, I flew my two sons to the game in Houston, and we attended in person. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know that. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, we, you know, it, it's, a, it's okay to coach at a different school and still be a fan of another school and your alma yeah. mater and places that you've – poured blood, sweat, and tears into. So, yeah, I mean, we were going into that playoff, obviously, he, you know, pulling for Michigan all the way. And, you know, that's kind of the point of, you know, the adversity along the way defines that journey and, and strengthens the team and just seeing the, that, that team in particular you know, overcome a, a lot of obstacles and a lot of adversity and every uh, reason they could have had to, to not uh, prevail, but they did. And uh, so it's great to see Coach Harbaugh and the squad hoisting that trophy, and it was even better to see it in person. 
How cool. How cool. I'm glad I asked about that then. That's a really good experience for you and and uh, and the guys. So, well, cool. Um, I'm looking forward to it. The, the season will be here before we know it. Eric, I hope to get back down and do uh, some more games at Clemson this year. So, obviously, uh, we'll be in touch if, if that's the case. And I'm sure we'll talk at some point during the season here. But thanks so much for the time. Best of luck getting started with practice this week and, and getting things rolling. And, and um, hopefully a, a, another season of, of some success there for you guys. Let's do it. All right. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate you having me on. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate you.